We are recording this, and it will be housed on our uh, SPAN website um, shortly after the webinar. So hi, everybody. This is Diana Otan. I'm the executive co-director of the Statewide Parent Advocacy Network. And with Carolyn Hayer and Don Monaco, I co-direct the Reach for Transition um, regional project. And I'm very pleased to talk today about Section 504 and the Americans with Disabilities Act Amendments Act, um, about the laws that protect youth and young adults with disabilities after high school, both in terms of education, post-secondary education, and in terms of employment. We're going to talk about the legal background of Section 504 and the Americans with Disabilities Act, um, and then uh, go specifically to how these laws apply to youth and young adults with disabilities after high school. So let's start with the legal background. Um, one of the things that's really important for families to understand is that there is nothing called an individualized education plan or individualized education program after high school. In fact, after high school, IDEA no longer applies um, for uh, youth and young adults with disabilities. And that means it's really very vital that youth with disabilities and their families understand the laws that do apply after high school. And those two laws are the Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act and the Americans with Disabilities Act as it was amended um, by the Americans with Disabilities Act Amendments Act. IDEA only covers students in the public school setting, while Section 504 and the Americans with Disabilities Act are broader anti-discrimination laws that prohibit discrimination against individuals with disabilities. Um, we're going to talk about the reality that the legal obligations of employers and post-secondary institutions are very different from the obligations of K-12 through public schools. Um, when we talk about post-secondary education in this presentation, that includes four-year degree-granting institutions, two-year community colleges, and vocational education schools. So what is Section 504? Section 504 is part of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, which is a national civil rights law. This law prohibits discrimination against people with disabilities by any program or activity that receives federal funding. So it ensures non-discrimination um, of people with disabilities of all ages in federally funded programs like post-secondary education, health care, housing, um, et cetera. It was actually the first civil rights law that protected the rights of people with disabilities. But again, its coverage is limited to entities that receive federal funding. But that does include um, most colleges. It does include um, state government agencies, et cetera. So this is what Section 504 says. It says, no otherwise qualified individual with a disability in the United States shall, solely by reason of her or his disability, be excluded from the participation in, be denied the benefits of, or be subjected to discrimination under any program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. So the words otherwise qualified individual means that a person has to meet all the other requirements for participating in a program in order to be protected against discrimination on the basis of their disability. For example, if you're talking about a student at a post-secondary level, um, you would be talking about somebody who meets the academic and technical standards to be admitted to the school and to participate in its program or activity. Once the student meets those requirements and is at that college, then they are protected under Section 504 from exclusion, den benefit denial, or discrimination. So an important um, related law is the Americans with Disabilities Act as amended in 2008. The ADA prohibits discrimination of people with disabilities by all qualifying private employers, that's Title I of the law, 
All state and local government programs, including public schools, Title II of the law, and all places of public accommodation, including non-religiously controlled colleges and universities. That's Title III. Section 504 was enacted prior to the Americans with Disabilities Act and has generally been used as the basis for disability discrimination protection in post-secondary institutions. Now, Title II of the Americans with Disabilities Act, like Section 504, protects students with disabilities from discrimination, but it does not have the same level of detail as the Section 504 regulations that relate to the education of students with disabilities. The Office for Civil Rights and the courts have generally interpreted the requirements of both ADA, Title II, and Section 504 consistently. So what this means is that to comply with Title II of the ADA, schools should follow the requirements and regulations that have been outlined for Section 504. Prior to the enactment of the Americans with Disabilities Act Amendments Act, U.S. Supreme Court decisions had begun to narrow the way disability was defined. For example, um, in a case called Sutton versus United Airlines in 1999, the court ruled that in determining whether a person has a disability under the ADA, any measures taken to control the effect of the impairment, like medication or corrective devices, had to be considered in determining if that person had a disability. In Toyota Motors versus Williams in 2002, the court ruled that a person's overall functioning had to be affected by the impairment of a major life activity, not just the activity itself, and also rejected protections for people whose disability or symptoms were in remission. So because of that narrowing by, by Supreme Court decisions, the Congress enacted the Americans with Disabilities Act amendments in 2008. So let us find out about um, some of these important terms. <clears throat> so how do we know whether or not someone has a disability under ADA and Section 504? Section 504 defines a disability as a person who has an impairment that substantially limits the student's ability to perform one or more major life activities. So there's three parts to this definition, having an impairment that substantially eliminates, limits one or more major life activities. Now, one of the things that's important is that the law also says that a person who has a record of having an impairment or who is regarded as having an impairment is also protected as a person with a disability. Students who have a record of having an impairment or who are regarded as having an impairment are not eligible for Section 504 accommodations, but they are protected from discrimination on the basis of the previous disability or the perceived disability. For example, if a student was mistakenly considered to have AIDS, he or she would be, prohibited, would be protected against discrimination based on that false assumption. However, because the student didn't actually have AIDS, they would not be eligible for any particular services or accommodations. So let's talk a little bit about what an impairment is. An impairment is any physiological condition that affects a bodily system or any mental or psychological disorder. So this physiological disorder or condition, cosmetic disfigurement, or anatomical loss affecting one or more of the following body systems, neurological, musculoskeletal, special sense organs, respiratory, including speech organs, cardiovascular, reproductive, digestive, genitourinary, hemic and lymphatic, skin and endocrine, or any mental or psychological disorder such as cognitive disability, organic brain syndrome, emotional or mental illness, and specific learning disabilities. Now, those are examples. Section 504 does not provide a list of specific conditions or disabilities that qualify as an impairment. Um, but if you look at that definition, you can see cerebral palsy would fit there, epilepsy, multiple sclerosis, cancer, diabetes, heart disease, 
HIV AIDS, dyslexia, dysgraphia, rheumatoid arthritis, ADHD and ADD, cystic fibrosis, severe allergies, asthma, etc. So unlike IDEA, where you have a list of specific qualifying conditions, Section 504 has a much broader definition of what constitutes a disability that would be protected under Section 504 and also under ADA. So now let's talk about the definition of substantial limitation. So substantial limitation is more than material limitation, but it doesn't have to be severe limitation. Substantially limits that major life activity. Um, so it materially limits, but it, it doesn't have to severely limit. So to determine the level of limitation, you have to look at the condition, the manner, and the duration of the impairment, um, the nature of the impairment, what the extent of impact is, the expected length of time that it can affect the individual. These are all things that would be taken into account. Um, for example, if you had an allergy that causes a rash, that probably wouldn't be considered substantial, but an allergy that might lead to anaphylactic shock would likely meet that definition. Two important points that were clarified by Congress when they passed the amendments to the Americans with Disabilities Act which now help broaden and clarify that definition of disability under both Section 504 and ADA. And the first point relates to mitigating measures. Remember that Supreme Court decision that had said that if a person was using some mitigating measures, like a hearing aid um, or medication, then they would no longer be eligible for protection under 504 or ADA. But the ADA amendment said, that mitigating measures cannot be considered in determining whether or not someone um, has a condition that substantially limits one or more major life activities. Um, for example, um, you think of mitigating measures with these things like assistive technology, auxiliary aids or services, um, adaptive modifications, prosthetics, etc. The only exception is the use of ordinary glasses or contact lenses. The second point that goes to this substantial limitation uh, definition is that conditions that are episodic in nature or even in remission can still be considered as a qualifying impairment if they result in a substantial limitation when they are active. So this might be cancer or epilepsy or depression. Um, if you have a, a really critical question, you can put it in the chat box um, and we can, um, you know, if, if if it's not a long um, answer, we can respond to that as we go along. So the third component of that definition is major life activity. So the impairment has to substantially limit someone's ability to perform a major life activity. Major life activities are things that are essential for daily living. These are some of the examples, but it's very clear by the language in Section 504 and in the Americans with Disabilities Act that these examples are not meant to be exhaustive. So um, if you look at things under Section 504 that have long been understood to be major life activities, you have caring for oneself, you have performing manual tasks, walking, seeing, hearing, speaking, breathing, learning, working. And then the uh, Americans with Disabilities Act amendments clarified that things like eating, sleeping, standing, lifting, bending, reading, concentrating, thinking, and communicating also fall within that definition of a major life activity. And then bodily functions um, that also should be considered major life activities, which were included in the Americans with Disabilities Act amendments, um, are brain, circulatory, endocrine, reproductive, neurological, the immune system, normal cell growth, digestive, bowel, bladder, and respiratory. Once again, this is not an exhaustive list, but these are um, clearly additional major life activities related to bodily functions that are covered by ADA and Section 504. So Lauren, when you, um, the question that you have there, um, we're going to be talking about what 
right now we're just talking about definitions, so let's just save this, your question about accommodations in college for, um, for the, where we're talking about those issues when we get past the definitions and other sections, okay? So just testing your knowledge, thinking to yourself, what's the name of the law that includes Section 504? It's Section 504 of a law. And what is that law? The Rehabilitation Act of 1973. We, we shorthand, we call it Section 504, but it is a section of the Rehabilitation Act. And then what are the three parts of the definition of disability under Section 504? Someone who has an impairment that substantially limits a major life activity. All right, let's talk about Section 504 after high school. One of the major differences for youth leaving high school is that they are no longer entitled to special education and related services. Under IDEA and the public school provisions of Section 504 regulations, public K-12 schools, and if those school systems also have um, public preschool programs, those programs as well, are obligated to evaluate students who are suspected of having a disability and provide them with a free and appropriate public education in the least restrictive environment. Post-secondary institutions, however, do not have a child find responsibility. In college or other post-high school learning institutions, services are based on eligibility. Students have to disclose their disability and provide documentation that demonstrates their need to receive accommodations and supports in college. Similarly, youth who need accommodations at work must disclose to their employer that they have a disability and require a reasonable accommodation under the Americans with Disabilities Act. Now, we know that deciding whether to disclose a disability is a personal decision. And we do have some resources at the end of the presentation that can help youth and young adults make that decision. Um, but of course, we believe that it is important for youth to know what their disability is and understand how it affects them and be able to communicate that information to their college disability services office or their employer's human resource office. Because if they do not disclose, then they are not protected. And so in a way, um, Lauren, the issue that you raise here about if a student has an accommodation letter in college, is it a 504 violation for the professor to ask all students who will be using the testing center, uh, distraction-free testing, to raise their hands um, because that might be um, something that would reveal that the student had, to, had a disability. That is not really something that is related to Section 504. It's more related to the education privacy rules, um, which do provide the student's right to privacy. Um, and we can, I think this is a, uh, an issue of, um, we can talk a little bit more about this a little bit later in the presentation. All right, so if you look at a side-by-side -side comparison in terms of eligibility determination, legal responsibility, and procedural safeguards, and see the differences between high school and college. So again, the process to determine eligibility is different. In public schools, the school district has to locate and serve students with disabilities, and so the high school or the school system um, bears the cost of evaluation. In college, students have to provide the school with recent documentation of their disability, and recent is typically less than three years old, as well as their need for auxiliary aids or academic adjustments. And if more evaluation is required, then the student or their family would be financially responsible. Secondly, in terms of what the legal responsibility entails, for public schools, they have to provide a free, appropriate public education. In college, the, stand, the standard is equal opportunity and non-discrimination, but they are not responsible to provide a free, appropriate public education at no cost to the student or their family. And then lastly, there are procedural safeguards in place in the public school setting and in college, but the ones that um, are available in the public school setting are stronger. Um, they include things like a um, impartial hearing or a fair hearing, often called due process. 
Um, there are multiple procedural safeguards that are, are part of the special education system. Whereas um, when you're talking about post-secondary education, students can either file an internal grievance or an external complaint. No due process hearing um, is required. All right, so let's look um, about some more information about the uh, rules that pertain to post-secondary institutions under Section 504. So first, the college can't deny admission um, to their school on the basis of the student's disability as long as the student can meet the academic and technical standards for participation in the program with reasonable accommodations. The college does have to make necessary academic adjustments to provide students with disabilities equal access and the opportunity to participate. In elementary and secondary education, these supports might be called related services or accommodations and modifications. In post-secondary education, they might be called accommodations or they might be called academic adjustments or auxiliary aids. Um, so some of the examples might include allowing students to make course substitutions to meet certain requirements, um, giving students more time to complete degree requirements, or providing accommodations such as the one that Lauren mentioned in her question, uh, like a quiet test taking environment or, or a, um, a distraction free environment. But they are not required to make changes that fundamentally alter the nature of their degree program. So they don't have to change requirements that are essential to the program or instruction that's being pursued by the student, nor do they have to alter any licensing requirements. <laughs> Auxiliary aids are supposed to support the student to make sure that communication is as effective for them as communication is for students without disabilities. Um, the college has to provide an appropriate but not necessarily the most sophisticated aid or service that will provide equal opportunity and access to the student with a disability. Um, the college is supposed to give primary consideration to the student's preference, but if there is an effective alternative, using that effective alternative is permissible. Colleges are not required to provide more general personal services to students with dis disabilities like personal care attendance or assistive technology devices that they would use um, at home. Now, IDEA or 504 services in high school don't guarantee eligibility for accommodations in post-secondary education. And so it's important to know that the student has to self-identify and provide documentation of their disability. And the student has to be otherwise qualified and meet the academic and technical standards for admission. Now, an IDEA or Section 504 plan from high school, even though it doesn't guarantee eligibility for ADA or 504 services in college, is an important piece of documentation providing evidence of a disability that colleges should consider. Remember that IDEA requires a summary of performance for students um, as they transition out of high school. And that summary of performance is critical to be able to be shared with the college so that they can see what the, schools, what the public school's perception is of the student's current performance, current levels of performance. However, colleges make their own determinations of whether a student meets the definition of disability and whether accommodations are necessary and reasonable. Once a student is determined eligible, the um, post-secondary institutions can't require updated information to reestablish eligibility if the student has a permanent disability. Again, it's important to remember that students have to take the initiative to identify themselves to the Disability Services Office as a student with a disability and provide the needed documentation. We're going to talk a little bit more about documentation um, on the next slide. If a college student wants an academic adjustment or auxiliary aids and services, they have to tell the college that they have a disability and that they need accommodations. Many colleges do have an Office for Disability Services to help students in this process, 
but the student is the one that has to take the initiative to contact this office and then later to contact individual instructors. Students with disabilities don't have to disclose their disability before admission, um, or they don't have to do it after admission if they don't want services. But if they want services, um, accommodations, they do have to um, self-identify and provide that documentation. So what kind of disability documentation are we talking about? It is the student's responsibility to provide an assessment that identifies their disability and functional limitations and the need for academic adjustment or auxiliary aids and services. So you can see here there are two main purposes of that documentation. The first is to provide the college with evidence that the student has a disability. And the second is to help the college identify appropriate accommodations, academic adjustments, and auxiliary aids and services based on the student's individual needs. The college should make this an interactive process and work with the student to consider his or her preferences for services. But remember that if there is an alternative service or aid that will meet the same objectives, the college is not required to provide um, exactly what the student is requesting. So documentation would typically include the student's most recent educational assessment, their most recent evaluation. This is one of the reasons why it's so critical to have um, those triennial evaluations and evaluations prior to a student leaving high school so you have updated information, as well as their most recent 504 plan or IEP if they had one. Um, colleges can set their own reasonable standards for what type of document documentation is required. And generally, colleges will accept the previous testing results if they are less than three years old. But again, if additional assessments are needed, they have to be done at the student's expense. Um, students can help the process by providing that documentation as soon as possible to make sure the college has an adequate time to respond to the request and to locate the needed services and aids that will help the student um, be able to be successful in the college environment. Now, college students essentially have four options if they feel they're being discriminated against on the basis of their disability. Of course, one is to try to handle the issue informally. Colleges generally receive federal funds, and therefore they have to abide by Section 504. And those colleges have to designate a 504 coordinator who is responsible for the school's compliance with, with 504 and generally would also be responsible for compliance with the Americans with Disabilities Act. So students can contact that person and try to address the problem informally. If the college is a college that does not receive any federal funds, and therefore does not have to abide by Section 504, they're still covered by the ADA. They don't have to have a 504 coordinator, but there should be someone in the college that students with disabilities can work with in order to address any concerns or complaints that they have. Now, colleges have to have um, 504 policies, again, if they receive federal funds, and they, and they have to have an ADA policy, um, whether or not they receive federal funds. And so that policy should have some formal grievance procedures as part of it, and students can consult that specific policy for their school and follow those grievance procedures. Students can also address the issue externally by contacting the Office for Civil Rights and filing a formal complaint. And the final option is for the student to file a lawsuit in federal court. So one of the things that I want to get back to in terms of the question about um, the professor asking all students publicly to reveal uh, whether or not they're going to be using the testing center, um, one of the things that would be important would be to look at the um, college's own policies regarding um, privacy and disclosure of information um, to people who don't need the information, as well as the um, policy and process for raising a complaint and um, follow, you know, reach out to the person who's listed in that, in that policy as the person that would be the person to go to to raise any areas of concern. So some tips for a smooth transition from high school into post-secondary education, recognizing that that transition from high school into post-secondary education can be very challenging. 
starts with contacting the college's disability or student services office and asking their procedures for requesting accommodations or auxiliary aids. So as soon as the student is admitted, they should be contacting that office to find out their internal college procedures. And then provide a copy of the documentation of disability and the need for academic adjustment or auxiliary aids or services. And this is documentation that students are going to be pulling together, hopefully with the assistance of their families. Make these requests for accommodations in writing as soon as possible. Remember that services like materials and alternative formats take time for the school to prepare. And so you really want to give the school as much time as possible to be able to meet um, your needs or your child's needs. Some more tips. Um, if the student receives special education services under IDEA in high school, they can use that required summary of performance that has to be shared with them by the school to gather information needed by the college. Um, one of the biggest changes from high school, remember, is that it's the student's responsibility to ask for services and to follow the college's procedures. And so students may want to make a checklist or a timeline to ensure that their accommodations will be in place as soon as they start college. Put requests in writing as soon as possible um, by communicating early with the Disability Services Office or the Office of Student Services and working cooperatively with the college staff. Students will help the process move more smoothly. Um, remembering that colleges don't have to provide exactly the same accommodations that are listed on an IEP or 504 plan from high school. They really need to have a discussion to decide what supports are going to be provided based on the student's needs. So before we move to employment, let's just have people post any additional questions in the chat box. about the post-secondary process. No, this presentation is not going to cover students entering high school. This is post-secondary. So it's after a student leaves high school. We're talking about post-secondary education like colleges or community colleges or vocational programs and employment. We'll, we'll address employment next. So we'll wait for one or, one, or more, um, one or two more questions before we move on. And I do, I do want to say, Ms. Niaz, that we do have many materials on the SPAN website about the requirements for students entering high school the, um, and the requirements for transition services. So please feel free, including a webinar that's um, on the website that you can listen to at your convenience. So um, Ms. Slater asks, what is, the law, what is the high school responsible for as far as assisting the student? So we're not going to be talking about the, the high school's requirements. Um, to assist the student, that's part of the transition to adult life process. And there are many requirements in the transition to adult life process. Um, we did mention the fact that there has to be a summary of, of performance that has to be provided to the student and their family. And that can be used in that process of working with the college to um, determine that the student has a disability and what services and supports might be appropriate for them. But um, we're not going to go into the other requirements around transition. You can certainly find that um, online um, on the SPAN website. We have webinars. We have resource materials, et cetera, that can give you step-by-step um, -step requirements for schools in terms of what they have to do to help the student transition effectively from high school to either post-secondary education or employment or both um, or the community. Um, so, uh, and Ms. Brill is talking about students that have not um, matriculated and that there are extension programs that offer community-based programs. And again, those extension programs, um, if they receive federal funding, they are bound by Section 504. If, um, as well as the ADA, if they do not receive federal funds, they are bound by the Americans with Disabilities Act. So let's move on to the issue of employment.
So the Americans with Disabilities Act is the primary law that prohibits discrimination against individuals with disabilities, including youth and young adults, in the work environment. I want to say that, remember, Section 504 applies to those entities that receive federal financial assistance. And so there are protections for employees of organizations that receive federal financial assistance um, that are covered by Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act. Um, but the vast majority of, of employers are, um, don't receive federal financial assistance, and so we're going to talk um, primarily here about the ADA. And remember that the ADA and Section 504 um, share many of the same requirements um, for uh, employment. So employers can't discriminate against people with disabilities in their hiring or their promotion practices as long as the individual is qualified for the job. Potential employers can't ask about whether or not the applicant has a disability, but they can ask about the person's ability to perform a job. So for example, if a part of the job is that the person has to drive to places where there is not public transportation, then being able to drive a car would be a requirement of a job that an employer could ask about. Now, once a person is hired, people with disabilities themselves have to request any needed accommodations in order to receive them. They won't be provided automatically. This requires self-advocacy on the behalf of the youth or young adult with a disability who first has to decide, once they've been hired, whether to disclose their disability, and they also have to have an understanding of the supports they need to be successful so that they can request them as an accommodation. Employers must provide reasonable accommodations to people with disabilities. And this means that the accommodations don't fundamentally alter the nature of the position, nor do they impose an undue hardship on the employer. An undue hardship is determined by the type and cost of an accommodation in relation to the size, resources, nature, and structure of the organization. So for example, if you are asking for accommodations from the mom and pop grocery store that's on the corner, you are going to um, uh, be entitled to fewer accommodations than if you were asking for accommodations from, for example, IBM or uh, Prudential or um, you know, some very, very large corporation. Um, reasonable accommodations are based on the individual's needs as well as the structure of the organization. Not only do they not have to provide accommodations that would provide an undue hardship on business operations, but they also can't require an accommodation that would substantially alter the nature of the business. Um, so can't ask about the ability, can't ask about disability status, but can ask about the ability to perform a job. Once hired, can't refuse to promote or uh, can't pay differential amounts or discriminate in any way because of the disability, has to provide a reasonable, reasonable accommodations, um, and those reasonable accommodations are only required if the person with the disability themselves discloses that they have a disability and what their, um, what their needs are. So I'm going to open up before we start talking about some of the references and some of the resources that we encourage you to check out. I'm going to open up the lines to see if we have any questions about um, employment requirements um, under 504 and the ADA. And Donna, do you want to open up um, the line as well as the um, chat box at this point to see if there are any questions about the presentation so far? Sure. If, if you um, entered the webinar through listen only and you're capable, um, please post your question in the chat box. If you need to call in and you don't have the capability of typing it into the chat box, we will put an 800 number there with a code that you can then call in, and we will hear you that way. So I'm going to enter that now. <laughs> 
I want to give a couple of other examples while we're waiting for anybody to have questions. Um, some of the kinds of things that could be a reasonable accommodation might be providing or modifying equipment or devices. Uh, it could be job restructuring, part-time or modified work schedules, um, adjusting or modifying examinations or training materials or policies, providing readers or interpreters, making the workplace readily accessible to and usable by people with disabilities. Um, but again, uh, the employer always can determine that such an accommodation to the extent needed by the employee could be an undue hardship requiring significant difficulty or expense. And in that case, then that would not be a reasonable accommodation for that employer. Um, but again, what's reasonable depends on um, the size of the organization, the resources of the organization, um, the nature and structure of the organization compared to the type or cost of the accommodation in question. Um, the ADA makes it unlawful to discriminate in all employer practices. So that would be recruitment, firing, hiring, training, job assignments, promotions, pay, benefits, laying people off, providing people with leave, um, all other employment-related activities. And it's also unlawful for an employer to retaliate against the person with a disability because you assert your rights under the ADA. So if someone raises a complaint about not getting reasonable accommodations, they could not be punished by the employer um, as a result of their efforts to um, advocate on behalf of their rights. Um, a couple of other things to note that anybody who is currently using drugs illegally is not protected by the Americans with Disabilities Act and could be denied employment or even fired on the basis of using illegal drugs. Um, and the ADA does not prevent employers from testing applicants or employees for current illegal drug use. So let's see if we have some questions. Does anybody have any questions before we move on to the next section? Nobody has any questions. OK. So let's talk about some resources. Um, the Americans with Disabilities Act Amendments Act of 2008. Um, and um, this, uh, I, think we will, I think we will send everyone, unless one of these handouts, out with the resources. Does the resources have um, all of the citations, Dawn, that we have in the trainer notes on the slides? No. So I can add them to the resource page. I have a resource page, but it doesn't have everything you have here. So I will add all of that to okay. it, and then I can send that out. OK, wonderful. So we have, we're, we'll be, we'll be um, sending you out the resources that include um, information about the ADA amendments. Um, there's a wonderful workbook called the 411 on Disability Disclosure by the National Collaborative on Workforce and Disability uh, for Youth. It's um, a great workbook to talk with your youth about disability disclosure. Um, we recently did a webinar on talking with your youth about their disability. Um, and there's also going to be a webinar um, on uh, disability disclosure uh, for youth and young adults. But this, this book is a really great resource to be able to talk with your young person about the importance of and how to um, disclose disability. Um, the Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act regulations. Um, we have a workshop on Section 504, IDEA, and ADA um, in the public school setting that's available on the SPAN website. There is also a good resource from the Office for Civil Rights Transition of Students with Disabilities to Post-Secondary Education, a guide for high school educators. Um, frequently asked questions about Section 504 and the education of children with disabilities, again, from the Office for Civil Rights. Um, the Office for Civil Rights has a publication called Academic Adjustments and Auxiliary Aids and Documentation. They also have um, a presentation on students with disabilities high school to college. The Equal Employment Opportunity Commission has a great question and answer um, guide, Americans with Disabilities Act questions and answers. 
And um, Wisconsin Facets has some resources on post-college um, use of 504 for students with disabilities. And here we have um, resources on the Office for Civil Rights and how to reach them, the website, as well as their national contact information, um, how to find your regional OCR office, and questions and answers about filing a complaint with OCR. And here is the list of the regional offices. And you'll see our regional office uh, covers New York, New Jersey, Puerto Rico, and Virgin Islands here in New Jersey. Um, but I know some of you are from other states, and so you can find your regional office either on the website or here on this slide. And if you want information about the Americans with Disabilities Act, um, the Department of Justice has a great information line uh, as well as a website that um, can provide you with lots of information, including fact sheets and information in some other languages. Um, as well as some questions and answers about different aspects of the ADA. There's also a national network of technical assistance centers that are funded to provide information about the Americans with Disabilities Act. And you can find your local um, TA center uh, by calling um, this number, 800-949-4232, or by going to adata.org. And I just want to mention that this presentation is based on a workshop that was originally developed by Wisconsin Facets. Um, their website and telephone number, um, they are a parent training information center in Wisconsin, just like SPAN is the PTI in New Jersey. Um, and this presentation was actually modified as part of a collaborative effort of the parent technical assistance centers funded by the US Department of Education, Office of Special Education and Rehabilitative Services, Office of Special Education Programs. And so with that, that is our last slide. And we're going to once again open it up for questions or comments, either about um, post-secondary education or about employment for students with disabilities under Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act um, or the Americans with Disabilities Act. So Diana, while we wait for people to post their questions, I do want to say that under the file section, um, they can find a copy of this PowerPoint um, along with other resource materials. And then I will send another email out. Great. So we have a question. Is there a website that contains names of colleges and universities where autistic youth, autistic youth can apply? So remember, it would be a violation of the law for any college to say, that, they, that an autistic student cannot apply. Um, there are colleges that have stronger or weaker um, disability access policies, stronger or weaker disability access offices. Um, this would be something that uh, you might want to reach out when you're considering possible places for a young person um, with autism to apply to college. Uh, you know, reach out to the colleges and, and ask questions about their, um, their disability access policies and their disability offices. Um, also, I would want to add that um, the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network um, has a program, a leadership program on college campuses that is intended um, to help build the capacity of students with autism who are attending college. And um, you can find out more about their um, leadership program by going to their um, to their web website. So um, it's the Autistic Self Advocacy Network, and their website is www.autisticadvocacy.org, um, and that we were actually just had a call with them yesterday about their um, kind of college leadership program. Um, and so reaching out to the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network might also be a place to start um, your search. So Christina Vogel asks, how can these students go about seeking financial assistance for college? So the same way that other students um, apply for financial assistance, um, there is no requirement that colleges make financial assistance available for students with disabilities any differently than they make financial assistance available for students without disabilities. Um, so you would just have to fill out all those 
FAFSA forms and um, go through all the same processes that anybody would go through to try to seek financial assistance for, um, for college, whether or not the student is a student with a disability. Any other questions? I think one of the most important things to remember moving forward is that um, it's critical that we start working with our children with disabilities long before transition or post high school um, activities because once high school ends, our children are, need to know about their disability. They need to know how to talk about their disability and how it impacts their learning or their work. They need to know how to be able to advocate to have reasonable accommodations. They need to know how to disclose their disability in effective ways. And these are all things that can't happen the summer between high school and college or um, the summer between high school and um, or, or immediately following high school for employment. So um, I know that there are fam that there are families who are concerned. They don't want to um, make their young person feel bad about themselves, or they don't want to um, limit the expectations or the hopes and dreams of their child. Um, but by not discussing the disability and the accommodations needs of our children, we really are putting them at a disadvantage because um, we're really not able to follow them around as they move from class to class on the college campus or as they go into work every day and um, you know, talk to their employer. So they really need to be prepared to understand and discuss and um, advocate. Uh, so there's the question about, um, so the issue of asking all students who will be using the testing center to raise their hands is really a privacy issue. Um, and so there are privacy requirements on colleges in terms of what information they disclose about students. Um, and so what I recommended is to look at the um, college's privacy um, rules as well as their information about how concerns such as these might be raised around disability issues and follow that process, follow those processes to um, make sure that the students' privacy rights are being protected. Um, I think we all would agree that um, having a conversation with the professor might also be a good thing to do because possibly the professor might not understand um, that what they are doing by asking this question and asking people to raise their hands is um, really basically um, an outing of the student as being a struggling student or a student with a disability, and perhaps an initial conversation with the professor to help them understand that this really is um, uh, sharing information about individual students who are raising their hands with the rest of the class in an inappropriate manner um, might you know, be the kind of first informal step to take to try to make it not happen again and, and help raise their awareness. Looks like we have a couple more people who are typing. Still typing. Okay, great point. My daughter is encouraged to discuss with her instructors what accommodations would be appropriate for that class and agree what that would look like. Excellent. That's, that's really the, the proper practice. Because the reality is you know, that students might need different accommodations or, or different supports in different classes. So for example, if a student has a, um, a writing disability, then um, they may, and there's a class where students are taking a lot of notes, then there may be one kind of accommodation that's required for that class that might not be, not, might not be needed in an acting class or, um, or in a home ec class or some other program where notes don't have to be you know, taken so um, explicitly. 
so um, or if a student has you know a math disability then they may need some kinds of accommodations in the math class that they don't need in other classes um, we have a question that says how can vocational rehabilitation help during transition from high school and how can we ensure appropriate services are provided during the high school year so um, as I noted earlier, we're not going to talk about the appropriate services during the high school years um, on this call. That is, uh, we do have lots of resources where people can talk about that. People can find out about that on the website, um, and, and that includes how VR can help. And I, I will say that um, that the Division of Voca or the, whatever it's called in different states, but in New Jersey, it's called the Division of Vocational Rehabilitation, um, can provide supports to. Uh, students to attend post-secondary education. I, for example, know a friend of mine who has a disability who received funding to go to law school from their um, vocational rehabilitation agency. Um, so there are supports and services that VR can provide, both in terms of employment and in terms of post-secondary education for um, uh, people with disabilities. The role of VR during that transition from high school is something that is covered in our transition um, from high school to post-secondary life materials. Any other um, questions? I do want to encourage you to go to the Parent Center Hub. Um, the Parent Center Hub is uh, the website of the National Center for Parent Information and Resources, and that has a repository of resources for families, and they have a set of mater materials around age of majority, which are really um, useful resources. They include a lot of information regarding what happens when students turn 18 and decision-making rights transfer to them under IDEA. And some of these materials include considerations for post-secondary education, considerations for employment, et cetera. Um, the frequently asked questions from Office for Civil Rights. That national, um, that ADA national network also has fact sheets. And you can find those fact sheets by going to the ADA fact sheet page at that adata.org. And then you can find all of our REACH webinar recordings um, on the SPAN website um, by following this link. And Carolyn put into the chat box um, a series of um, transition, look to the future um, workshops that are coming up. Um, and you can find those at www.spanadvocacy.org. All the resources on the National Center for Parent Information and Resources you can find at www.parentcenterhub.org. All right, I don't see any other um, questions or comments. And so I'm going to turn it over to Dawn. Oh, I see one more person who's typing. So we'll wait for that. And then I'm going to turn it over to Dawn um, to um, talk about any next steps. OK, that person stopped. OK, Dawn, I'm turning it over to you. Thank you. So as we said earlier, I will email uh, you a new sheet with resource material as well as a link for an evaluation that we ask that you please complete for us. We, um, from those evaluations, we make changes, make revisions, update our webinars um, for in the future. So uh, we would thank you if you could please do that. Thank you for attending this webinar. I hope that it was helpful. Uh, it, will, it was recorded and will be housed on our website under that link where it says Reach Webinar Recordings. So you can um, listen to it again, or if you missed part of it. And I will be emailing you with some more resource material. So thank you. I hope it was helpful. And we hope to see you soon at one of our next webinars. Have a great day. And thank you, Diana, for a job well done and very informative. Thank you. And thanks, everyone, for joining. <laughs> Bye.